Can we turn to Revelation chapter 18? And can I get someone to read Revelation 18 verses 1 to 3? And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Mm -hmm. Now, what stands out to people about this message um, yeah. this angel gives? Does anything stand out to people? It's fallen. Mm -hmm. Yep, the statement that Babylon is fallen is fallen is there repeated twice. It's a double emphasis. So that means mystery Babylon's fallen. So it's um, it, it, it's um. It's crumbling. Mm. It's, um, yeah. Yep, Gailene. Um, in uh, Revelation fourteen eight, mm -hmm. it says, "And there followed another angel, saying, This one he cried mightily." with a strong voice. The message is the same, but it's given in a completely different way. A lot more, you know, if someone's in danger, you don't say, oh, look, don't, don't do that danger. You're going to raise your voice. You're going to raise the pitch of your voice. And you're going to, you want people to, you know, to pay attention or to get somebody's attention. Mm -hmm. An interesting thing as well is birds. Birds back in the day they were used as um, messengers. So um, a haunt for every unclean and hateful bird can, can mean like messages like un unclean and hateful messages mm -hmm. yeah. um, and like it, it mentions you know information will increase and like to and fro and, um, and that's that's exactly what's happening mm -hmm. just a uh something else on, on what Gailey mentioned before back in uh, Revelation 14 where we see a, a similar message here it, it, it says both that Babylon has fallen and also that all nations have drunk um, of the wine of the wrath of the fornication uh, you, you mentioned that the, that second angel it just says they've followed another angel saying um how is the first and the third angels messages introduced? How are those messages given back in chapter 14? That's got a loud voice. Mm. So it's like you've got a loud voice, someone just saying, and another loud voice. So there's <coughs> maybe it was, I know, would it be a case of in Revelation 14, the other two messages were a little more important for that time. 
and this one okay it's important because it's been put out but maybe it's even it's getting by the time you hit revelation 18 it's really really important and time is of the essence type situation i i think it's it was always an important message um but sometimes the messages were given different emphasis by the people at the time for example it's a lot easier to give a, a message about you know um you know that, that system's evil that's the mark of the beast don't get that but people are really comfortable giving that message with a lot of enthusiasm people are comfortable giving the message of you know the sabbath worship god that made heavens and earth and and the seas and the fountains of water that they're happy giving that message with a lot of emphasis but the message that there are these Babylonian things in the world that we need to come out of, that we need to not be a part of the world. That, that's a message that um, a lot of people don't give with the same amount of emphasis. And I think historically in the church, we see that happening. When, when these messages went out, um, you know, in, in the um, you know, early or mid uh, eight to late 1800s, um, you know, as we looked at when we're going through, you know, that, that Revelation 14, when the Sabbath message was given, this message of the investigative judgment was given, you know, those messages went out with a loud voice. People proclaimed them strongly. Um, the message about the mark of the beast and the Sabbath, you know, especially around 1888, was given with a, with a loud voice. You know, several Adventist ministers had been arrested for working on the Sabbath. One of Ellen White's own sons was arrested for operating a printing press. Oh, sorry, on, on the Sunday. Um, the, the US Congress was passing a bill to enforce Sunday worship. You know, th th these messages were, were given with power, but um, it, all, it all failed. Um, the church failed to actually be ready and I think the reason for that is that second message, the church didn't put a lot of emphasis or power into that, into the idea that this Babylon had fallen, that we're not to be a part of that, that system. Because if you look at the, what Babylon is doing, um, that the principles of Babylon that make it so, um, evil and so opposed to god is it exercises matters of kingly power in areas of religious conscience um if, if i was just to sum up the character of, of babylon exercising kingly authority in matters of religious um conscience um and at the same time the church was trying to proclaim the Sabbath with a loud voice and speak about the mark of the beast with a loud voice. In 1888, um, there was also a, a, a Minneapolis conference that the church held dealing with righteousness by faith with, with Jones and Wagner. And I, I don't know how familiar people are with that, but um, after that, Ellen White commented on it and she said that there was a, a problem that the church had that was manifested there, a certain type of power. Um, is anyone familiar with what she referred to it as? No, she, she called it kingly power. She says people in, in the general conference were, were exercising kingly, kingly power, kingly authority. Um, to try to shoot down Jones and Wagner, seeing themselves as the, 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 the sort of the keepers of the pillar, the, the keepers of the old ways. And now we're defending the truth against these, these young people from the, the West Coast um, that were bringing in these different ideas. And so they exercised their kingly authority to stay the, 
the course of the church on the direction that they thought it needed to go. So at the same time where we were supposed to be giving a message against Babylon, that Babylon has fallen, the church itself was exercising kingly authority on matters of religious conscience. And so that second message was not given with any loud cry. It was not given with a strong emphasis. The church had failed to um, correctly identify the character of Babylon and to forsake its principles. And even today, that's something that the church struggles with a lot. Uh, Gayling. So to get this straight in my head, obviously Revelation was written 1900 years ago. <coughs> And the prophecy was that the first message would go out with a loud voice. The second message was just to be spoken. And the third message was also to go out with a loud voice. So that... Well, I've all got, the messages I've got, I've got were supposed to go stuff. out with a loud voice. Okay, so but what the what church it says... failed to do that, and so the prophecy here also records that the church failed to give that second angel's message with a loud voice and with power. So that's why, as you say, the messages were supposed to go out all equal, as it were, but the prophecy records how it was actually how it ended up going out so almost like in chapter 10 where it tells about the great disappointment it's recording what it sees to be the future and what we see as the past hmm. so this is doing the same sort of thing mm -hmm. okay Thank you. The first angel's message was given with a loud voice. The third angel's message was given with a loud voice. But the second angel's message, there was no loud voice accompanying it. Um, and I think that was seen in the, the church's failure to properly identify Babylon, um, who to identify Babylon, the characteristics of Babylon, and to actually rid itself from that. You know, the, the idea that they had come out of Babylon, but they hadn't got Babylon out of themselves. They, they had brought it with them. They had brought the same worldly um, way of governing their church. And that was seen in the 1888 Minneapolis Conference. And because of that, um, we're still here. Because of that, the, the, the church failed to carry forward um, the, the calling that God had given them. But in Revelation 18, we have seen another angel, a fourth angel, that comes along. And he repeats the second angel's message. But this time, it's not simply saying with a loud voice. We're told that he comes down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice. Here we see that the, the level of emphasis that is given uh, here um, in this this fourth angel's message. But he doesn't just repeat the second angel's message. What does he add to it in Revelation 18? What does the fourth angel's message add 
to the second angel's message. Oh, uh, Gaylene. What? Um, the first angel's, sorry, the second angel's message says that she's made all the nations drink of the wine. <coughs> Here, they've drunk of the wine. So one is, <coughs> um, I know she made all nations drink of the wine. So, you know, they're both past tense. Um, but this one includes the kings and the merchants. Mm -hmm. um, and they've also, um, as Joel said before, you know, there's also this, there's the added description of the birdcage and the habitation of devils and the foul spirit. So there's an additional description of how bad it actually is, I guess. Hmm. Um. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, there's a lot more description in there. It's become the habitation of devils, the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every hateful and unclean bird. And so it's like you know all these sins and all this corruption and uncleanness building up in Babylon. Babylon's, it's like Babylon's getting darker and darker and more and more wicked. You know, the, the, it's not just the nations, the kings and the merchants are all being made drunk with the wine of a fornication. And it's interesting, as, as Shari has mentioned there, as, as Babylon's getting darker and darker, this angel comes and the earth is lightened with his glory. Yet there's this contrast between the heavenly message and the state of Babylon in the world. then we get this sort of there's this message is continuing with another voice can somebody read in revelation 18 from verse 4 to 8 Revelation 18, verses 4 to 8. Go for it, Ralph. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her, double according to her works, and the cup which she has filled, filled to her double. How much she has glorified herself, and live deliciously, so much torment and sorrow give her. For she saith in her heart, I sit a queen, and am no widow, and shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire. For strong is the Lord God who judges her. What does this next part of the message add? to um, what the fourth angel has presented. It's time to get out of Dodge. Essentially, but it also goes on to say, um, yeah, there is a judgment coming. Because um, like you've got this <clears throat> come out of her, my people, for her sins have reached unto heaven. So her sins have, you know, filled the cup of, um, <clears throat> like is often talked about in the Old Testament, you know, they, um, where God would judge a nation because they have filled up their cup of iniquity. 
So she's obviously filled up her her cup, or in this case, have reached unto heaven. So that's a really big cup, and it's very full. Mm. Um, but according to the, the end of verse 8, for strong is the Lord God who judges her. <coughs> Considering, she says, I sit a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow such arrogancy that God can't touch her mm. and it's like nah that's not the way it's going down that's not how it is mm. yeah thank you Petra just commented there that um it states that God uh, has people who are still in Babylon at this time. The call is to come out of her, my people. Um, and I, th I think that's one of the, the things that it's not until these final scenes start unfolding that a lot of people's eyes will be opened. And so the message is, you know, yes, Babylon has fallen and come out of her, that she be not partakers of her sins. And that you receive not of her plague. I also find that interesting when we jump back into Revelation 14. Where we, we saw there that the second angel's message was the Babylon has fallen, and the third angel's message follows that not to receive the mark of the beast, or you will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of indignation. Here, after being told Babylon has fallen, we're told to not be partakers of her sins, that you receive not of her plague. So again, it's a very similar message. Although here it says, don't be partakers of her sins. In Revelation 14, it's don't receive of the mark, that you do, do not, you know, receive the wine of the wrath of God, and here that you do not receive of her plagues. And so while the, the fourth angel there in Revelation 18, verse 1 to 3, is repeating the second angel's message with added emphasis and descriptions of all the, the additional sins and corruptions that have been building up in Babylon. This next voice that speaks in verse four has a message that's, that's similar to the, the third angels of not receiving the mark, not partaking of the, the sins of Babylon that we don't receive of her plagues. To me, this is clearly the latter rain in the first few verses of 18 there. Mm -hmm. Delighting with his glory. You know, mighty, strong voice. Mm -hmm. well, that's what I reckon anyway. Yeah. Yeah. How, how do you connect that with the latter rain? Are you there, Ralph? Well, none of the other messages talk about the earth being lightened with its glory. Mm. That's something pretty major to me that, you know, sticks out. And the mighty, strong voice. Mm. Mm. I'm just trying to think. I think most of the references in earth, well, at least those who dwell on the earth, are always the people who oppose the gospel. Um, you know, the, the beast from the earth is a, an evil one. Um, you know, I, I know at least those that dwell on the earth, it, it's always those who are opposing the gospel. At this time, it's the whole earth's life and with the glory. That, um, yeah, this message goes with a, with a power that hasn't been seen before, not even in the, in the previous angels' messages. So there's an extra blessing of, of the Spirit of God upon those that, that carry this message forward. I actually posted a question in one of my groups. Um, 
can Trinitarians give the three angels messages? Mm. No, because it says, fear God and give glory to him. You put your hand up. Which God are you talking about? Because it definitely says he. So mm. it's referring to one. And that one is the father, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But I guess they have sort of been giving it, but yeah, I don't know. Not many people got back to me about it. So. <laughs> mm. So after we have this, this message that Babylon has fallen to come out of her, that Babylon will be judged for her her wickedness, her filthiness, her adultery, her arrogancy. Next, um, well, actually, for the for the rest of the chapter, we have the responses of those who are witnessing the destruction of Babylon. Can somebody read uh, Revelation eighteen, verse nine and ten? And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewild her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. Hmm. So... This is the kings of the earth here. How do they respond? What's their reaction to this judgment that God brings against Babylon? Galen. Well, the kings of the earth are the rulers. So... In today's world, that would be politicians, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. But uh, they've been <coughs> obviously living deliciously with her. They've, you know, they've been all nice and cozy, and you know, doing deals and you know, living the good life, as it were. But they're going to lament her. They're going to mourn I suppose her, her passing but they end up standing afar off for the fear of her torment so I don't know <coughs> I don't know what that is unless it's a case of they don't want a part of that judgment to fall upon them so they're kind of standing afar off and saying you're on your own but I'm still going to mourn. I I, I, I don't understand. It, it sounds like very much a, a politician's thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> we're, it, it we're, we're said you're gone, but we're not going to do anything to help you. Yeah, that pretty much does sound like politics, doesn't it? Mm. <clears throat> and um, obviously there's that whole one hour thing as um, someone put in the chat. Yeah. And, and that, that is a question. Is it a, a prophetic hour or just a figure of speech? Um, and, and that's something that is slightly ambiguous. The other time prophecies in Revelation, um, you know, it, it's clear that they, they are referring to an actual time period. Um, because when it's, you know, a day, an hour, a month, a year, there's no figure of speech that uses that but if it says just an hour you know it's going to be an hour you'll that is a figure of speech referring to a short time um similar to how we would today use if someone asks hey can i get a hand and you say yeah i'll be there in a second you know by saying i'll be there in a second you're not actually describing an actual period of time that's going to take you to get there 
you're just using a figure of speech to say you'll be there um, be there soon. Um, but if it is a prophetic time, it's interesting that um, in verse 8, when it's speaking of the judgment of Babylon, it says, therefore shall her plagues come in one day. And then when the kings are mourning, they say, um, for in one hour is thy judgment come. And again, down in verse 17, the first part of verse 17 is the end of the, where the merchants are, are mourning her. And they say again, for in one hour, so great riches has come to naught. Um, so if that is prophetic time, that would indicate that from the, the close of probation, when the, the plagues start being poured out, poured out it's, it says one day, which would mean it would, would be a year. Um, the plague is being poured out on earth for a, a full year. Um, and at the final destruction of Babylon under the sixth plague lasts two weeks before it's completely destroyed. So, um, yeah. There's not really, a, I don't think there's enough here to know exactly which way to understand that as a figure of speech or as a prophetic time because there's there's no other scriptures that i can think of that we can compare it to to um inform us on how to interpret that uh Gaylene. so when it says in verse eight and she shall be utterly burned with fire to me, that um, speaks of completeness, you know, thoroughness. You know, no stone left unturned, as it were. You know, there's going to be nothing left, kind of like Sodom and Gomorrah mm -hmm. type situation. <clears throat> now, we don't know how long Sodom and Gomorrah burnt for. But given the fact, I mean, that was a literal burning whether this is going to be a literal burning or whether it's going to be utterly burned as with fire as a euphem euphem is a, a, a saying for just absolute destruction mm. um but then again we also have the saying of you know you if you play with fire you get burned but it doesn't always mean literal fire. So there's still, to, to my mind, utter destruction of this system and everything that's attached to it by proxy, I suppose. Um, yeah, I, 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 I don't know. Um, but the fact that it's utterly burned is... Whether that includes a time frame, who knows? I mean, some things take a while to, I mean, you can utterly destroy something, but some things can still take a while to be utterly destroyed. Like you can get volcanoes that give out that, that slow lava that kind of creeps along. I mean, it destroys everything in its path. It just takes a while, as opposed to that real water-like lava that just goes, that spreads like water and it will destroy fast. And it, but it will still destroy. So, yeah, I, I don't know. So we've got the announcement so far in Revelation 18, that Babylon's has fallen, come out of her that you don't receive her judgments, and then the kings of the earth and their response to her judgment. After that, from verse 11 to 17, we have the merchants of the earth. Uh, Joel. Oh, did did you see the chat? Uh, yeah, mentioned that. What that the judgments has turned Babylon on its head. That that the um hour. And back in the day, it was an hourglass of sand, and so in one hour, it's turning it on its head. 
Yeah. So, meaning, yeah. The, that, that type of speech in one hour is meaning Babylon has turned, the judgment has turned on its head. Mm. In a figure of speech, one hour. Mm -hmm. And it makes sense that, that, too that, because that's just one possible um, thing, and, and like like we mentioned, um, we don't have other scriptures to compare it to, so it could be a figure of speech. Um, it says one hour. Um, it says the plagues come in one day. They they could be a literal time period, or they could be just a, a figure of speech saying these things will happen quickly. Well, a, a day can be a year, but an an is is not really a, a measurement for an hour, but well, a day in, can be a year. In previous time prophecies, um, under the, the the trumpets, we see there was a time period for a, a, a day, an hour, a month, and a, a year, and that pointed out to the day, um, the time period that the Ottoman Empire was was ruling for. And so we took that day for a year principle and just applied it to those periods down to an, an hour and it worked out um, precisely. Um, so tw 24, which is how many hours are in a day? Yeah. Divided by uh, 365. So how, how many? Two, two weeks. Two weeks. Yeah. Well, that's that's it then. It's either turned on its head or it's two weeks. Mm -hmm. mm. And um, someone read from verse eleven uh, down to seventeen, which is the first part of seventeen with the the merchants. And how they respond to the destruction of Babylon. How does it describe the merchants? And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth her merchandise any more. The merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and of pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and all thy wood and all manner vessels of ivory and all manner vessels of most precious wood and of brass and iron and marble and cinnamon and orders and oilments and frankincenses and wine and oil and fine flour and wheat and bees and sheep and horses and chariots and slaves and souls of men and the fruits that thy soul lusted after are departed from thee and all things which were dainty and goody got uh, goodly are departed from thee and thou shalt find them no more at all the merchants of these things which were made rich by her shall stand afar off for the fear of her torment, weeping and wailing, and saying, Alas, alas, the great city that was clothed in fine linen, and purple, and scarlet, and decked with gold, and precious stones, and pearls. For in one hour so great riches is come to naught. For every shipmaster, and all the companies in ships, and sailors, and as many as trade by sea, stand afar off. Hmm. So how do these merchants respond to the destruction of Babylon? What stands out to people about their response?
Pauline. These guys are also standing afar off and weeping and wailing. They're mourning as well. But mm. the merchandise that's listed, that pretty much covers about everything you can think of you can trade in. Mm. You know, whether you've got organic, inorganic, whether you've got food, spices, humans, um, uh, what do you call it, transport, your animals, you name it, clothing, um, you, you've got... It's, it almost seems like an unnecessarily fun. long list. It, <laughs> it, it does, and I don't know whether in, in today's world, whether it, talk, where, where it talks of gold and silver and precious stones and pearls, you and in today's world, that would also probably include the stock market and your investment, your money on paper type situation stuff. Well, I think a, a pertinent question to ask is, um, why does it go at length to spend two verses just listing all the various things that they're selling and trading? Diversity. don't know <laughs> it's, it's like it is reinforcing because all those things that are listed basically are the riches of the world mm. so it is a reinforcement and also it's like well make no mistake all these things are part of the riches people could mm. argue that hey we need wood it's not riches it is essential because we need wood to keep us warm we need clothing to keep to cover ourselves that's just part and parcel of a basic need but here it listed down basically it's basically telling you you know it's encompassed in all that is under riches hmm yeah yeah, I think that's a very good explanation. That's that's wanting to emphasize that, you know, these are all the riches of the world that they were getting rich with when they were trading with Babylon. That the the economic system that Babylon had set up to make them rich encompassed everything. You know, that they weren't just interested in one or two, you know, profitable items, but the, you know, this worldwide economic system encompass the buying and selling of any everything and i find it interesting that they're, they're mourning saying in verse 11 for no man buyeth their merchandise anymore you know that they That's were very including happy. the souls of men mm. that is the interesting bit so basically it's telling us that in the last days the souls of men are being traded mm -hmm. absolutely but yeah, they're, they're, they're mourning that no one's buying their merchandise anymore. Yet when the Babylonian system was using them to make other people not be able to buy or sell, they were happy to go along with that and ban other people from buying and selling stuff. But now that no one's buying their stuff, it's suddenly a problem. And they're mourning and weeping that, that this could happen. You know, I, I find that sort of like an interesting tables turned they were happy to do it to other people but now that they're losing out it's all weeping and mourning i also noticed the sort of the the, the last two verses there it's very similar to what the kings of the earth said. Um, it mentions the merchants who were made rich by her. Um, and in verse 9, it talks the kings of the earth who committed fornication with, with her. That's how they're both mentioned in verse 3. For all niceness have drunk of the wine of the wrath of a fornication. And the kings of the earth has committed fornication. And the merchants of the earth waxed rich. Um, so those were the, the two ways these groups were mentioned um, up in that fourth angel's message. 
they're both, uh, you know, crying. Um, they're both standing afar off for fear of a torment. And they both talk about this, her judgment. All the so great of riches have come to naught and that, that one hour, whatever that, that specifically means. But in verse 17, we're introduced to another group. Can someone read verse 17 to 19? For in one hour, so great riches has come to naught. And every shipmaster and all the company and ships and sailors and as many as trade by sea stood afar off. <coughs> and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, what city is like unto this great city? And they cast dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, alas, alas, that great city, wherein were made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness, for in one hour is she made desolate. So again, what stands out with these ship masters or, or sailors? What stands out about their response? Joel. They were um, pretty distraught, really. And um, and this is in one hour again was laid waste mm. so whether that one hour is referring to two weeks um because these days ships run on gas uh, diesel and coal so that could be e economics but as well i i, I don't know is that uh, there's, there's a lot of stockpile in the world. So I, I don't know about two weeks. Mm. So it could just be. Well, it's, it's not the ships the that were destroyed here. It's Babylon that were destroyed. And those in the ships are, are, are wailing and weeping and well, crying because of the destruction of Babylon. Uh, it says there in verse 18, and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning. Mm, yeah. So it's the third time it mentions Babylon being destroyed in in one hour. Mm -hmm. But I find it interesting that the it tells us about Babylon being destroyed, and then it gives us the reactions of the kings, the merchants, and the um, shipmasters and sailors, and those that own ships and trade by sea. Um, and their, their responses, they're all, all weeping and mourning. And it, it sort of um, brings up the idea that we, we've covered a few times is that the, the Babylonian system, this, this final satanic power, um, actually rose to power by popular consent. That the people that were part of the system wanted it. Um, you know, you, in a lot of the, well, in all the movies that are made and a lot of the, the pop culture and, and, and even, you know, um, in the church, that the idea you got was that this would be this evil system that, um, you know, the, the greedy, power-hungry people would, would use and they would enslave the entire world. But they're not actually enslaving the entire world almost the entire world 
wants to be a part of it. They wanted this system. There was only the faithful few who stood up against it. And that's where we get the, the final response. So we've had the response of the kings, the merchants, and the sailors. Can someone read verse 20 to 24? And we have the, the final response to the destruction of Babylon here in chapter 18. Someone got that for us, Revelation 18, verse 20 to 24. Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, <clears throat> for God hath avenged you on her. And, he might, and a mighty angel took up a stone, like a great millstone, and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down, and shall be found no more at all. <coughs> sorry, and the music of, sorry, and the voice of harpers, and musicians, and of pipers, and trumpeters, trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in thee, and no craftsman of whatsoever craft he be shall be found any more in thee, and the sound of a millstone shall be heard no more at all in thee, and the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee, <clears throat> and the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee, for thy merchants were the great men of the earth, for by thy sorceries were all nations deceived, and in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that was slain upon the earth. Hmm. Now, what is the message here for, for God's people? How, how are they responding to the destruction of Babylon? Yeah, Galen, they're, they're rejoicing. Told to rejoice, thou heavens. So the he heavens are rejoicing. The holy apostles and prophets are rejoicing. It says, because God has avenged, her, avenged you on her. God's come and judged. This is the, the, the cry of, of God's people that are crying out for, for justice, the martyrs and that, that we've seen throughout the, the book of Revelation. In, in their suffering and persecution, finally God has come to judge Babylon. And it says at the end there as well, that in her was found the blood of the prophets and of the saints and of them that were slain upon the earth. Uh, Ga Galen, do you have your hand up there? Oh, I was just going to mention the, um, you already touched on it, the... Um, the blood of the martyrs from under the altar mm. but you, you already you already touched on that mm -hmm. mm. previously within your revelation the blood of the martyrs they are crying out how long till you avenge us and god says no rest a little while that there are more to be slain in revelation 12 when the dragon was persecuting the woman tried to destroy her god gave her wings so she could flee into the wilderness you know, she, she, she was to, to run away. But this time, no, God's coming to, to destroy Babylon, to judge her for all the, the wickedness, the evil, and the suffering that Babylon has caused. 
and it uses this imagery this mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea saying with violence shall great babylon be thrown down as shall be found no more at all it's this yeah the, the final destruction there's not going to be anything left after this and again it, it emphasizes that no music no craft no millstone so no no one grinding bread making food no candles no lights no marriage there's going to be nothing left in babylon this is destruction as a final destruction and right at the end there verse 23 it says, for thy merchants were the great men of the earth, for by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. Well, that's happened to an extent, hasn't it? Mm. So they found out that these vaccines did not stop the transmission of the disease. <laughs> so they were diseased and they spent billions of taxpayers' money for no reason at all, really. Mm. There should be I'll, some big lawsuits coming. <laughs> I'll share my, my screen here. Um, is what Galen and, and Ralph mentioned there. When it says, um, for by thy sorceries were all nations deceived, that word sorceries there, as you can see, it, it comes up. It's the Greek word is, is pharmakia. That's where we get the idea of, you can see there in the definition, of pharmacy of medicine. Um, and it, it was used to refer to magic witchcraft sorcery because you know the, the whole idea of witches making potions to, to heal people um but it was and generally used of of medicines that it you know the the, the sorceries the medication the the pharmacy would be responsible and and playing this part in um yeah deceiving the nations and I have to admit, I have to admit, um, years back when I was first studying Revelation and someone brought that up to me, I, I thought to myself, well, maybe it's just a coincidence, like that, that the pharmacies, the pharmaceutical industries would, would be responsible for deceiving the world to bring in these, you know, um, government overreach taking away freedom all this stuff i was like it's just a, maybe a coincidence but um as you know ralph mentioned with, with what we've seen of lately i've had to sort of yeah take a step back and think that's something i was <laughs> was wrong about um because that's what we've seen is this this worldwide system did develop based on everything that's happened with with COVID with these, these pharmacies, these vaccine mandates and passports and all, all the things that, that we saw happening. And, and not just that, um, I purely shared the, the other week about other separate, you know, just not non-governmental, just medical bodies that are being established that, um, you know, everyone's got to, to agree to their, their terms and conditions to be able to operate, that these are the things that, um, we see spoken of here in, in Babylon, um, these systems that are going about to control the world, to bring everything into this one system where you cannot deviate from it, where you cannot live by your conscience, you must live by their rules. And here, Is Ralph referring to the recent video footage of the European Parliament hearing? That happened just a couple of days ago. Yeah, I saw a bit on the uh, Great Britain news. Yeah. About it and that sort of thing there. How all the people lost their jobs in the health services and they should be compensated for having it done to them and that. I think there was a clip that um, later on the people who were sitting there not not that lady that represented um, Pfizer. Um, there were other people that were sitting there listening and they said, if 
any of the governmental body actually admitted to being in cahoots with them, the big pharma, you can imagine the riot and the uprising of the people. So for that reason, government agencies, healthcare system will never ever back down, will never ever admit it that they knowingly, you know, get people to be vaccinated, even though they, you know, that is at the back of the, their mind, they know that was the truth. It kind of brought me to the same thing and the parallel that do we think the Jews after putting Jesus on the cross know that he was the son of God, that he, they actually killed the Messiah? I think they do. In their heart of hearts, they do. But because of pride and consequences that would face, they will never back down and admit to the fact that they have done wrong. Mm. I think there's a you know, great parallel there. And then if you go further, if you look at Lucifer, I, he knows he has done wrong. But will he back down? No, he wouldn't because pride will not allow him to back down. It's the, it's, you, you have a tree parallel there that it's, it's just so plain to see. Yeah, and that's one of the things that stands out in Revelation 12 when it speaks about, you know, Satan fighting against Michael and, and him losing, being cast out of heaven. He says, woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the seas for the devil was come down to you having great wrath because he knows he has but a short time you know when he was defeated at the cross when he was proved to be wrong that's when it says you know woe to the earth he knows he's wrong he knows he's lost and that's when sort of that's saying that he's most dangerous now um yeah, he's he knows he's wrong, but his pride is refusing to let him to acknowledge it. He's going to fight to the end, even you know after the resurrection, the the second resurrection. He still goes out to deceive all the people that were resurrected in the second resurrection and getting them to attack the city of God. even after having a thousand years to think about it as well. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's a really good um, parallel there, Pearly. You know, it doesn't matter how much evidence that stands up against them. They're never going to admit it. They're just doubling down and again and again and again well michael baker in um, university of otago is asking the government to resurrect the traffic light system again that hmm. tells you they're not going to back down They're going to continue their path of destruction, just like Satan is going to continue on his path of destruction. So if I'm going down, I'm going to take as many down with me. And that's his plan. That's his strategy. Mm -hmm. Well, there in Revelation 18, it starts off with that the, the loud cry of the fourth angel that repeats the second angel's message which gives power to the third calling people to come out of Babylon and then from that we see the destruction of Babylon how the kings, the merchants and the sailors respond to that but how heaven and God's people are, are responding to their, their deliverance 
And it, it, one of the, the big contrasts there is, you know, it, it speaks about in Babylon was found the blood of the prophets and of the saints of all that was slain upon the earth. It, it's interesting, it's not just prophets and saints, but and of all that was slain upon the earth. Babylon wasn't just killing God's people, it was responsible for so much more death and destruction that it needed to, to build its system. And the kings of the earth and the merchants, when Babylon was destroyed, they didn't care about all the suffering that it caused. They were only caring about the riches that they made by supporting Babylon, by being part of that system the power and the authority that they were given, that they got to exercise over others. And now that Babylon's destroyed, they've lost all of that. Next time we'll get into to chapter 19, where it carries on with the, 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 the final comments the destruction of Babylon and the second coming that quickly follows it. Uh, Gaylene. I'm just looking at my Bible where it says in verse 24, and all and of all that was slain upon the earth. My Bible has a cross-reference to Jeremiah 51, 49, which says, as Babylon hath caused the slain of Israel to fall, so at Babylon shall fall the slain of all the earth. So that's that's an interesting one. That it was, you know, told of old. Mm. Isn't there another reference where it talks about back to the blood of righteous Abel or something? Was that referring to the Jewish... I know Leaders Jesus or... mentions that to the Pharisees, you know, that they um, say, you know, garnish the tombs of the prophets or something and say, if we had been in their days, we wouldn't have been partaken. Um, and then decorate their tombs, wherefore they testify that um, they're just as evil. And he said, of them would be required all the blood of the righteous from the righteous Abel who came so to Zechariah who was slain between the porch and the altar. And he says it would be required of them. Because they were the ones to, you know, slay the Messiah. And in doing that, they rejected Abel's message of righteousness. They rejected everything Moses said. They rejected everything Samuel and the prophets said. They rejected everything, you know, Zechariah said. And so they, they've rejected everything that every one of the prophets and martyrs has said. So in rejecting all their message, they're guilty of um, the same destruction that was brought upon them. <clears throat> 